your manager at Billericay from 1969 until November 78. And returned to the club 80 to 81 season. Left in 1981. Uh, Great, okay, right. So, when did you first get involved with football? Yeah, a very tender age. I've always been massively in, involved in sport. Uh, cricket was my favourite sport at one stage, but um, I've always been a student of sport and uh, I was totally fascinated with football and the development and what created more intrigue for me was I was ball boy when England played Hungary in 1953. It's like they come from a different planet. You know, their football was so superior and sophisticated that um, I wanted a, that sort of prompted me. I had no ambition really to be a manager, but I was so inspired with this style of football that I thought it might be worth a try. And just to create some new visions in football because it was very stereotype, our football. In fact, under English management, I think it still is. You don't see many creative managers that are English, do you? They're nearly all of foreign extraction. Were you, any, were you a good player yourself? Perhaps not as good as I should have been. You know, I, I set my standards too high. I always expected more of myself. Um, so I was disappointed that perhaps I didn't do better. When did you first hear about the Ricky and Adibar? Um, the, the club I was last at was Tilbury, the last amateur club, or non-league club. Um, but then I was changing job, and I also didn't have a car. So I was doing <coughs> some preparation for my new job, but at that same start time, I wasn't playing for any club. So my brother was at Ardley Green Football Club and his team, I think it was the third team, hadn't won a game for two years. He said, would I play a couple of games? Anyway, I played and uh, got involved at Ardley Green. And um, then I took over as player manager and I invited a lot of my pals there, you know, like Ricky Payne, Kevin Corbett, John McGowan, all players that came here. And while I was there, I spotted some very good players. Um, Freddie Clayton being a wonderful example. But Arthur also came to, to Ardy Green as well. He was one of the players that joined me at Ardy Green. So we had quite a good side there. And um, it was all going pretty well. And to be quite honest, I would have been probably quite happy to stay there. There were two things missing. One, the pitch wasn't big enough to play the, the, the style of football that I was hoping that we would play. The other thing is we didn't have a clubhouse. Um, so when I got the opportunity to come here, I thought it'd be worth a try. Do you have any particular favourite matches or that stick in your mind that you were excited over? Well, the... the the big matches for me, the outstanding matches, were the farmer games the boys have already referred to. They were the, the best team, the best team we played against in my time here. They were so well prepared and uh, we, as one of the chaps has already said, we learned a lot from them. They had the resources. We didn't have resources here. We, we won so much without resources. So a great credit to the boys. Um, so we learnt so much, as they've said, in terms of apparel and uh, they were a bit in front of us, but we managed to we managed to do it on the day. So what would um, what sort of team talk? What were your twin talks like? Were you like get angry and throw chicken wings at people, or what was it? What was your I think it's really understanding players, you know. Some you have to put down and some you have to give a, a sugar lump, you know, or a pat on the back. 
Um, it just depends. Some get a bit above station and others are lacking in confidence. So. It's treat them individually is, is a key thing. Collectively uh, in the dressing room as a team to function, but individually, yeah. And they all, they were all level-headed, they were all smart, good players, all technically good, and all winners, all winners. They had to be that, they had to have the mentality to win. Um, you know, I wouldn't want them to go home without feeling hurt if we'd lost. Just dismiss it, not good enough. Um, yeah, tell me about, we'll go through the players, so if you start with Jeff. Jeff Aslan. Yeah, Jeff was um, a big target man, wouldn't be intimidated. He was, um, I wanted everybody to play football. We were out there to play football, but prior to Jeff's arrival, we only had one player that was a deterrent. And um, that player was Mike Payne, a bit of an unsung hero for me. Because if there was any skirmishes, I would just say to Mick, have a word with whoever. And Mick would take care of it. And all the other guys could concentrate on playing football. And um, Jeff sort of filled that role as well. He was sort of not in charge of it. We wouldn't get bullied with um, Mike Payne and Aslett in the team. They weren't, the other boys weren't wimps, they could all look after themselves, but when you all get involved, it takes your focus away a bit. So, um, so yeah, Jeff did a good job. What about JP? John was, yeah, a quite unsung hero, really. He was such a good athlete, so level-headed, so disciplined. Uh, we played man-to-man -man marking, so we had outstanding defenders. You know, Arthur was the organiser, Steve Bowen was unique. Mike Payne was one of my sort of unsung heroes. And uh, as we say, John Pullen, Paul Blackhaller joined, he was another outstanding defender. We got him from our big rivals, Chad Heath. And what a great signing he proved to be. Uh, Paul Blackhaller, another one that, uh, that we picked up. Freddie. Freddie, yeah, I saw, played against Freddie. So as a player, I knew how good it was. And I had to work, as Freddie's pointed out, I had to work very, very hard to get him here, to get him to the club. But it was, a, it was worth it, wasn't it? Yeah, he's proved to be a great hero here, a, a legend as a goal scorer, and a fantastic player. Done a great job for the club. Dougie. Dougie, special. Yeah, very talented player. So unfortunate with his injury that he's had a shortened career. But Christ, he made his mark in that very short time, didn't he? So uh, another legend won't be forgotten, Hattrick at Wembley. Only the second man to do that. So, unique. unique. Arthur, brilliant. You know, outstanding leader. Um, always in control. Um, not fearful or intimidated but intimidated by anything but played the ball very good distribution very calm wonderful player yeah so the the yeah come up to the final finals day what did you do did you play around how did you make sure everyone's up or what does the manager do well the game wasn't quite that different from other games and other finals we've been in and i wanted it be it to be kept at the same level. I didn't want to make it that special. One of the things that I'd sort of picked up on, being a student of the game as I was and still am, was that Wembley teams crumble because of the pressure. They can't cope with it. They're good till they get to Wembley. And I was so keen that, that we weren't going to be exposed to that. So we tried to keep the pressure off and just let's enjoy it, let's play our football. And we met our match, they were a very good side, and we sort of cancelled each other out a bit. So neither team was able to dominate, but they were up for it. They weren't a bad side, you know, they were a very good side. And they matched us, and we just edged it. And I think we just deserved it. So we didn't play our best football, but credit to them. They didn't allow us to. What about the Sheffield match? The Sheffield match, well, they tried to bully us a bit. 
you know, they tried some tactics. I won't go into what those tactics were, but they did it because I think we were hot favourites having beaten Farnborough. And uh, they tried a few stunts on us. Um, but um, we weren't our best on the day. We were very flat after the game, but we picked ourselves up fantastically to win the five-a-side and the lights the following day, which was what a wonderful. Shows of the character of the team to do that. And then in the replay, we went up to Knott's Forest Ground for the replay and we were up for it. You know, we picked up sufficient from the first game to probably impose ourselves. As, you know, we've already said, I think we deserved it. All the finals were very close. You know, we didn't win in great style, but we won deservedly. Um, yeah, so we were delighted to win the twice. So what did you allow and what did you, once you, obviously you're celebrating now, it's, they can let their hair down, they can do what they want. Were you, were, you, were you strict and how did that change once you won that? No, we, we were quite good at celebrating. We never got tired of that. And uh, if anything, we got better. But um, no, the, the Wembley one was special because I think we've realised it puts you in history. I mean, we were doing pretty well until Wembley. But it elevates the whole situation, Wembley. It's a bit unfair, really. It's not. I didn't think it's that special. I mean, don't get me wrong. Wonderful getting there. And if we hadn't have got there, you'd look at the career and say, well, you didn't get to Wembley. So, yeah, good in that respect. But all the other, nothing was easy. Nothing was easy. The first competition we won, the Olympia League, we won by goal difference. You know, I think we won the last eight games without conceding a goal. So, how tough was that? Yeah, it was. Yeah, just to say, I mean, the, the number of people out in the streets was fantastic. Yeah, that would never be forgotten. Um, the whole support. And the support was fantastic at the club. You know, it was like a new dimension, but the whole secret of that, in my opinion, was they hadn't won anything for 90 years, and now we started to win things. And the other aspect was it's a sports and social club. So when you're a sports and social club, you're a little bit closer to a lot of the supporters because they're at the club at the same time as you are, you know. Yeah, just that, um, yeah, everybody came out to celebrate, didn't they? And the more the merrier, because we celebrated. What did you think of the fans during your spell? During my spell, um, the fans were fantastic. The fans were fantastic. I mean, as I say, part of that was because of the Sports and Social Club. So a lot of the fans we were closer with. You know, we knew on a personal level. And that, that helped. Um, and they were desperate because of the less, lack of success. So it gelled. You know, we were, the players that we brought, the team that we brought, hadn't won collectively that much. We've had our moments, but hadn't won that much. So we were all enthused and uh, and raring to go. That's it, raring to go. So what's your, what's your favourite memory of being with Keith? Well, it is the Farnborough one. It is the Farnborough one, because I knew them so well. We They were our biggest rivals, but our biggest friends. And in actual fact, I mean, amazingly, one of the big things that we needed with our style of play was a good scout. We always had to know how the opposition were playing so that we would set up accordingly. And um, Colin Saul was our chief scout here and did a fantastic job. And I think Arthur took over at one stage and then he, and he did it for a year, I think. So the last year I had here, I didn't have a scout. But Ted Pierce, the manager of Farnborough, we're in the same league as Farnborough now, our biggest rivals. He used to phone, or I'd phone him, and he'd give me a rundown on the opponents. Absolutely amazing. Our biggest rivals and our biggest friends, really. I think it was a bit of mutual respect. But we learnt so much, as one of the boys has already suggested, we learnt so much of them because they had so much resources. You know, I mean, they had... I think after one of the games, I spoke to 
their chairman and said, how do you go about, uh, how many training balls does Ted have? He said, 20. We had three. If, I, th I think I'm exaggerating, it might have been only two. And um, we got some girls to do a charity walk for us, raise money to buy training balls. Things like that inspired us. And uh, so I think where they were a bit naive, um, where they were a little bit too helpful. They were a bit too helpful. They gave us too much information. I mean, and particularly when we played them for the second year in this semi-final. I mean, after the game, the first game we lost 2-0, I said to Ted Pierce after the game, um, Ted, I didn't think much of um, Kevin Sheedy elbowing John Pullen during that game because the referee didn't do anything. He said, well, did the referee... Did the referee see it? Did, what are you on about? So I thought, oh, if he doesn't see it, you can get away with it then. And then I um, said to him um, about the footballs and also something else that he... Uh, yeah, he, he said, how do you go about getting all your equipment for Wembley? So I said, well, Ted, I'd be only too pleased to tell you, but let's get the second game out of the way first. And of course, we won that 6-0. So he never asked me. Oh, yeah, in 100 years from time now, how would you want to be remembered? Yeah, the uniqueness of the performance of our team. It was unique. The uniqueness to me was confirmed in the Rothmans Handbook, 78-79 when we were the second team in the country to win the Rothman, that Rothmans Award. Liverpool were the first, we were the second.